Hey, welcome to day 63. In this day, uh, we're going to go in a little kind of mixed up order because we usually have to because of half days. Basically, we're going to really dig into the cardiovascular system and start making our way into the excretory system with GR44 this week. So we're going to combine the two together. Uh, for those of you who didn't attend the first AP Bio review session, the next review session, talk to your AP Bio buddies about how useful it was. A lot of them seem to like it. And we get your work done. The next session will be the Tuesday after you get your new assignment. We'll be going after the 2013 FRQ. So papers that you would need for today, you'd need your lab book as well as you would need your GR42, but you'd be picking up these papers in class normally. Our targets for today is we're mainly going to go after uh, looking at diastolic versus systolic, um, blood pressure, heart rate, understand how those variables change, and then mixing a little stats in there to really get your, uh, your heart beating with some chi-squared analysis review as well. Uh, we would have done the frog dissection right before this, and we'll tie back into that a little bit later, but they're all connected because it's the circulatory system. It's all circular. So grab out your ETD, and if you open up your ETD, you would notice that there is uh, two cute little boys. Well, there's uh, questions that you'd be filling in. You're going to save room for, of course, B and C, and I'm going to get rid of my ugly face here. And the first question I ask you is, what are the variables in a chi-squared analysis, and then how do you use them? So this is where, of course, in class, you would be taking your best guess and you'd be pausing me so that uh, you could actually see what you know. Make sure you save room for B and C. <laughs> cool. After you had a time to try to figure this out, and I made fun of your homework assignments, I would then show you an awesome video from bozemanscience.com with Mr. Anderson. And he does a really nice job, and you should watch this clip. The link is right there. Going through, he does two example chi-squared analysis, the first one with a quarter of coins, and then a more complica complicated one with a six-sided dice. Going through the variables that are there, you should watch it as well as his other stats ones if you're rusty on your Hardy Weinberg. He does a wonderful job, and yeah, he's a little creepy in terms of the fact that he looks a bit like somebody else I know, but we won't mention who. The other part of it is at the end of it, he gives you an animal behavior, uh, one to practice out. You can check out if you got the right results with that because often they'll go after animal behavior or they'll go after Hardy Weinberg with it or they love to do uh, genetics with it because it's good for anything that you did any math with this year in AP Bio. So pause me now, go and watch the video, then come back and we'll return to the ETD. Since I can't do that, we'll just go straight into the ETD. For the big ideas for chi-squared analysis, we should notice that it's pronounced as chi-squared, not chi, not chai, right? We're not getting T here. And that, of course, is for the chi, the little X, the Greek symbol. And chi-squared analysis, of course, has this big sigma. That sigma means sum. So you're going to add up a bunch of smaller values. That's normally the part kids forget. Then the formula is a lot like uh, percent error. It's observed minus expected squared over expected, which is a lot like got minus shoulda over shoulda with a square because it's chi squared. The O, of course, is the observed. It's what you actually see, right? They're going to provide that data for you in the question. The expected, of course, is what you would expect to see if things were perfect. This is why you want to know like the, uh, the different ratios in genetics or what a Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium should look like, right? Numbers that you'd want to know. Mitosis, meiosis kind of stuff, right? The reason why we use chi-squared L, the reason for using it really is to figure out deviations cause. When you get a data set, you're going to find out that it doesn't fit exactly what you expect. And if there's a deviation, the question is, okay, if something's off, why is something off? And the question here is, is the being off, the deviation, just a matter of chance, because chance plays a role in the universe, or is there actually something else going on? Is there something fishy going on that would mess up ratios, like crossing over or natural selection in a Hardy-Weinberg, right? Other terms that matter inside of chi-square is this idea of the degrees of freedom. And we looked a little bit at this when we were looking at phi populations back in genetics. Degrees of freedom is not as cool as it sounds. It's basically going to take the number of categories, right? If it's coin, then there's two categories, and you minus one, right? You subtract one. What it is, it's the number of other choices. So if I'm heads, then my other choice is tails, so that's one degree of freedom. If I've got four different genotypes uh, or phenotypes for flies, then that means there's three other choices that I could be if I'm a red-eyed fly or whatever. 
right? So then we take that, and most importantly, we take that, and we use that on a chart, but then we compare it and use it to find this thing called the critical value. And like it says, it's critical. You use it to criticize, to analyze something. That will be on a table that they would provide for you, right? And when we look on that table, you need the degrees of freedom, and you use it to find your way on the table, and you always use 0 0.05, which is 5%. That's the 5% probability that you're always going to use for AP Bio because we, of course, are not stats. We don't care that much about the numbers, right? We care more about the interesting stuff called biology. But we'll let stats people do that. If, crucially, you calculate and you find that your chi-squared value, that's the one that you calculate where you have a bunch of little subtotals, you add them all up to get this weird-looking number. If that chi-squared value that you calculate is, of course, less than the critical value, that's the one that's on the table that they'll give to you, then that means a crucial thing. There is deviation, but it's just due to chance. This means that you can accept the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis being that there was no strange thing going on. There was no correlation between the deviation and some other variable. It was simply deviation was caused by chance, right? So don't forget null means that there's no correlation, right? If, however, you find out that the chi-squared value is greater than the critical value, meaning all the little numbers that you added up were bigger than the one of the critical chart, well, that criticizes it, and that means that you reject it. That means that there is something fishy going on. The deviation is just is not just chance, right? There's something smelly about it, and if we're looking at a genetics problem, that's probably going to be crossing over. You know, recombinant chromosomes. If we're looking at a Hardy Weinberg, that's probably going to violate the five different characters or characteristics that are required, the five requirements for Hardy Weinberg. You got some natural selection, you got some sexual selection. That's usually how they like to use it, right? So the good news is this is a more clear way that you can actually read it. It's on the PowerPoints that I also provide for you since they don't have to talk on the screen while it's doing it. So if you had trouble with that, definitely watch Mr. Anderson because he'll go through the two examples and then you can see how these two things figure out. But really chi-squared is almost always on the test. We'll see if it's on this year, but it is every other year. And it's really just figuring out, hmm, is the data that I have, is it is it off just because there was something that chance threw it off a little bit, like back when you were breeding flies and flies gone wild? Or is it because there's actually some natural selection going on or something like that? So it's handy and scientists actually use it, so they want you to know how, you do, how to use it. Now, normally I'd give you a break. Today's a half day. It's always a half day when it's remote learning for me. So that means, of course, we can dive into our other part. And if you listen very carefully when I stop talking, there's a sound that was the very first sound that you ever heard. Now, that beautiful sound was lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. And the first time you heard it was inside your mommy. It's the, the first sound that you will ever hear in your life. And most people, when you say, hey, what's that lub-dub sound? They say, hey, that's, that's your heart. But they need to be more specific, right? Now, ironically, it's also the last noise you will ever hear. Because when your lub-dub stops, you stop too, right? So I want to know what specifically is the lub-dub sound in your chest. And then what is SPDP and MAP? And how is it related to it? So pause it. Try to answer it. See what you know. And then play me again and see if you can keep up, right? Nah. All right, here we go. If we look at this, that love dub sound, most people would say, oh, it's your heart, right? Well, your heart is made out of muscle. And if you take your bicep and feel it, you can contract your bicep. And it can, of course, do exactly what your heart is doing, contract. But if you listen to your bicep, it doesn't make any noise when it does that. So it's not the muscle. Instead, what it is are these beautiful things called valves. It's valves closing. Your heart has a series of beautiful doors that it has evolved. Now, by this point, we would have dissected frogs and started looking at our own hearts and hopefully recognize that the mammalian heart has four chambers. The two upper chambers are called atria. The lower chambers are called ventricles, right? So if we cheat and we go down here to the, uh, from the patient's view, this would be their right ventricle. There would, of course, be some connections between this because blood has to come into this thing called the atria, and then it has to go through a door, and this door, of course, is called the atrial ventricular valve. As the atria contracts in the top part of the heart, it pushes blood down into the ventricle. 
Now, crucially, when it goes down into that ventricle, that's a large chamber. It's going to fill up with that blood, and then you're going to need to send it to your lungs. So it's going to exit out this thing called the pulmonary artery. And the pulmonary artery is going to carry that blood, but to do that, that means that the ventricle has to contract next. Now, crucially, you hear the lub, and that lub is the actual sound of the AV valve, the atrial ventricle, slamming shut when the ventricle contracts because it slams the doors back into it. Lope. That allows the blood to only go in one direction, not back flowing into the heart, giving you efficiency to push it out towards the lungs. Now, when it does that, there's another set of valves that are over here at the exit from the ventricle in the pulmonary artery at the start of it, and this is called the semilunar valve. And that's where the dub comes from. Now, as the blood pushes out into this artery, like all arteries, it's elastic. This is a blood vessel. And if you're healthy, the elasticity of that is helpful because now you're shoving a bunch of blood at it. And that elasticness causes the blood vessel to swell out, but then the collagen in it allows it to contract back. So this pushes back on the heart. It's like you push a wall, it pushes back, right? It's Newton's third law. Now, when that happens, that makes blood want to go back into the heart, but you don't want that, so that's why the back pressure causes this, the semilunar valve, to close, and that's what the dub is. This is the semilunar closing. So notice we should notice, the main purpose of these valves is they're awesome. They prevent backflow. They prevent blood that, of course, should travel in one direction from traveling in two directions, and they prevent things like blood that's oxygen poor from mixing with blood that's oxygen rich, increasing our efficiency. So the availability of these valves is pretty crucial. And uh, if we look at that, what happened in here, when I was a kid, I actually listened to uh, my dad's heart, and so did his doctor, and his doctor noticed that there was this weird sound every time there was a lub dub, lub dub, and that's because he had a deformation of his valve. And uh, that heart murmur was blood leaking backwards and it's fairly common for, for humans because, of course, our hearts don't always form correctly. There's a lot of genes that are playing a role in forming that. We'll talk about that later. But that heart murmur is a fairly common uh, problem with cardiovascular systems where that valve doesn't form correctly or overuse for a long life causes it to deform. And now we actually have surgery where you can fix the little cords, the chordae tendinae that attach to those. It's a pretty amazing time we live in, frankly, right? Now, along with that, you can notice that this pushing creates pressure. And there's two types of pressure. There's SP called systolic pressure and then there's this thing called dp which is diastolic pressure we should just call them that now diastolic pressure and systolic pressure are different systolic pressure will always be the higher pressure this is the pressure of of course pushing the blood to the system which means what this really is this is the pressure of the ventricles contracting as they shove out the blood, they do it with all the force of that massive muscle, like your left ventricle, out to your entire body, and the other one to your lungs, right? That's the higher pressure because it's got to have that push of the ventricle. When you measure this, this will always be the higher pressure reading that comes first, and that tells you about the heart's health. If you've got a good systolic pressure that's not too high, not too low, then the heart is nice and healthy and strong. If it's not, you run the risk of not getting enough blood flow, and that could cause other problems like lack of blood flow to your brain. Diastolic, of course, always be the lower pressure. And I always remember diastolic is the dying down pressure. Systolic to the system, dying down pressure is the diastolic because this will always be the lower pressure. This is the pressure of the vessels pushing back. You shove the vessels and they push back. So what this gives us is this gives us the vessel's health. And considering the things like arterial sclerosis, where your, your blood vessels actually get clogged up and harden over time with plaques because you like steak and fatty acids too much, it's kind of important that people understand both the health of the heart and the health of the blood vessels. Now, cool thing is there's an average good number for an average adult, but it's different for everybody because we all, of course, have variations in our size, and that's what your lab goes after. It's 120 over 70. You know, if my doctor says, hey, you're 120 over 70, and I'm always watching the needle when they do it, that comes in, hey, that means that my heart and my blood vessels are healthy. But you'll also hear another thing called the MAP. And the MAP is what they use in emergency rooms. It's called the mean arterial pressure. And mean, the average, arterial, talking about your vessels, right? And there's different ways to calculate it, but the one I like is it's one-third systolic plus the two-thirds the diastolic, which gives you your MAP. And you put that together to give you one number. 
And anything over 60 is a pretty good sign that you're going to be okay as long as it's not too high. Notice that it does it at two thirds diastolic because for two thirds of the heart cycle, it's filling up the ventricle. That's two thirds of its cycle. And then one third systolic because it's a very short amount of time where the ventricle actually goes one third of the cycle if everything is humming along just right. Here's a way you can read it a little bit clear. You can always pause it, right? And you can look at the note sheet. The other thing we should notice is the lub dub sound is not the actual muscle, it is the valves. The atrial ventricular, when the ventricles contract, they're slamming shut, giving you the lub. And then the semilunar valves that run into the aorta and the pulmonary artery are the ones that are giving you the dub, right? Lub dub, lub dub. And here's a good animation with some sound effects supplied by Neil. We're filling up. There's one third of the site or two thirds of the cycle to fill up the ventricle down there at the bottom. And then you can see. It's filled, lub, dub, lub, dub. Although it does much smoother in your heart, right? So notice that we have two separate little beautiful valve systems set up with our double fish heart so we can load it up and drop it off. Now, what we normally do today is we would do a lab that's actually quite fun where we torture you with ice water and make you exercise and stuff and you learn how to measure blood pressure and your heart rate. The heart rate one is pretty straightforward. You take your two fingers on your one hand you put them in the little notch that's right there on your radial artery, and you can feel a nice little bup, 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 bup. And that, of course, is the pressure of your ventricles contracting as it shoves it out there. Now, you want to know it for one minute, but the way that nurses and everything cheats is they basically count the number of beats for 15 seconds, then you multiply by four, and that gives you a pretty good idea. If you're in the range of like 50 to 60 beats per, per minute, you're doing pretty good. You're not dead, right? Anything higher than that, you might be taking an AP exam. Ha! Now, the other part of this is measuring pressure. To do that, we use a thing called a sphygma manometer. <laughs> and that is, of course, a pressure cuff. And it's going to measure the systolic and the diastolic by basically cutting off the blood flow with this pressure cuff. When it does it, of course, what we're looking for is the 120 over 70 for a healthy 20-year-old average, right? And the way that you do it, because you're going to go off to other schools and sports med really pays off at this point, is you put it on your patient, which would be your, your classmate at this point. You have them sit down so that they're blood pressure cuff is even with their heart. So there's no pressure difference between the heart and where you're measuring the pressure. You put the cuff on very carefully and you would cut off blood flow to their brachial artery, basically their arm down to their hand. You'd, press, you'd pump up the pressure to about 160, closing the valve. They, of course, if they experience pain, you would stop. Then the next thing that you do, of course, is you'd let the pressure back out. And as it goes out, you'd see the pressure on the sphygmomanometer, the pressure reading over here, actually go down. And what you're listening to with your stethoscope is right here is you're listening for the sound. As you pumped it up and cut off blood, you wouldn't hear the pulse anymore because you cut off blood flow. As you open it up, you'll eventually hear a <laughs> And that's the sound of, of course, blood squirting into that artery, just like water squirting out of a hose. That's the sign that you've hit the highest pressure the heart can achieve. That's the systolic. Then you continue to drop the pressure all the way down until you no longer hear the <laughs> noise. I'm spitting on my screen. And what you're doing there is you can actually watch the needle on your pressure gauge, because yours will be an analog device usually. And what it does is it will stop hopping the needle or when you actually hit the point that you've got the pressure, you start to see it jump because now we're getting the pulse showing up in there. And the pressure reading, of course, that it reaches that point of no noise and you start to see it bump again, that is the diastolic pressure. So you have to try it a couple times. If you don't have a blood pressure cuff at home, bummer. I've got one here. They're kind of fun to play with, teach my kids how to use. Now, the other part of this has to do with what the blood vessels themselves are doing. We would do a series of experiments where we would change your body position. We'd look at your blood pressure laying down, standing up, sitting, doing exercise. We'd stick your hand in a bucket of ice to simulate a shock and fear experience to see what that does to your blood vessels. And one cool set of things that they can do is they can do basically a garden hose thing. If you go through vasoconstriction, you're going to constrict these things called precapillary sphincters as well as the actual walls of the arterioles, and they contract and get smaller, just like holding a hose, and that takes the blood pressure and increases it, right? Vasodilation is the exact opposite. This is where those sphincters, great word, and the arterioles themselves relax, and as they do that, like an unpinched hose, they can now flow, so blood pressure would drop. The exercises and body positions would change some of those things, especially the bucket of ice, because it's a fear, a shock experience. Have you ever seen somebody's face go white with fear? It's because there's some constriction of capillaries in their external body, right? Their periphery. So the other part to notice is the MAP, 
we can see in this, it's two thirds diastolic filling the ventricles and one third of it is filling the atria. So it's one third, two thirds, lub dub, right? That of course goes into what you go into an emergency room. And in the emergency room, they're gonna just yell out one number. So if you have a patient that's like 120 over 80, you should be able to calculate their mean arterial pressure. If you have stopped me and try it, then I'll show you. If you do that, it's a one third of the 120, the systolic, and two thirds of the 80, so you get 93.3, which means the patient's gonna be perfectly fine because they're within the category of 70 to 110. The book also gives you another way to calculate it, but I prefer this one because it actually matches what the heart does. Two thirds diastolic, one third systolic. And yes, that's George Clooney when he was young, although I think he was still like 50 back then. Yeah. Now, today in class, you would normally get to play doctor. You pick a really good doctor name. I'll be Dr. Doolittle because, well, that's it's your lab, not mine. And of course, that was my real doctor's name and he didn't do a whole lot. And be aware that if you have a patient and you got a blood pressure cuff and you can take your own pulse at home, that's easy. You should try these actual experiments because one, they're fun. And two, you can see how your body reacts to it and then go through and see what your health rating is with all these things. Be nice to your patient, especially if they're a family member because he's smiling because that little girl would sue him, right? Now practice insurance. That's why doctors make a lot of money. So as you go into the lab, you try those things. Pause me now. Try out the lab if you, you know, are really bored as many of you indicate you are because it's actually fun. And then, uh, we would try it in class. And as we summarized it in class, we would notice some things, right? You should set up this chart in your, inside your ETD. We would take your sitting blood pressure and your standing heart rate and your fitness numbers and we compare the boys versus the girls in class, right? And we'd also compare your data versus mine. So here's basic data that we see as a pattern, right? My blood pressure is about 120 over 80. So my doctor is bumming because he doesn't get to do heart surgery on me. Most students is in that category, or actually, it's actually uh, kind of higher. And one thing that we definitely notice is girls tend to have a higher blood pressure than the boys in class. And that makes sense because most of the girls of your age group are actually smaller. And being smaller means they have smaller blood vessels and smaller tubes to run fluid through means it's going to be at a higher pressure. So girls tend to have higher blood pressures than boys. Boys being physically larger have larger blood vessels. We would do the ice experiment where we'd <clears throat> simulate shock, where we'd stick you and it would kick off your parasympathetic nervous system, the fight or flight response, and that causes vasoconstriction. If you, of course, are afraid with fright and you're sending your blood to things like your muscles and your heart and your brain so you can think faster, it cuts off the blood flow to your outer extremities. That's why people are scared pale. And that means that, of course, that's gonna increase your blood pressure because you're vasoconstricting the external parts of your body. The standing heart rate, I'm at about 56. Most of you actually have a heart rate that's gonna be higher than that. And that's because age has an effect. Being older, I have a lower heart rate because I have bigger blood vessels and I'm not growing. My body's given up on me. You need to do mitosis. So you're constantly supplying blood to grow new cells so that you can grow. That's why you're so hungry too. So that's why your heart has to work harder. The good news is most of you are student athletes and being student athletes, you exercise a lot. Now, exercising a lot does some great things. It helps to increase your heart size so that can lower your heart rate and your blood vessels get bigger so that you can flow that stuff, right? Then we do the experiment where we have you lay down and you'd find out that your blood pressure actually decreases. And then you stand up and your blood pressure increases. And that makes sense because when you're laying down, the, the muscle that's pushing the blood is at the same level as the rest of your body, so it's not working against gravity. That's why when people are in shock, we lay them down and we try to make sure their heart is even with their head. We can lift their legs to increase blood flow in that area because the blood pressure is even. If you stand up, now your body has to push blood against gravity up to your brain, as well as you're contracting your leg muscles, which puts pressure on those blood vessels inside your legs. That's gonna increase your blood pressure. Your heart rate also increases because it takes increased energy to run the muscles to stand up and balance yourself. That's why a lot of people have heart attacks when they get out of bed because they're increasing their blood pressure and their heart rate at the same time. And if they got an unhealthy heart, that can trigger off, you know, myocardial infarction, a heart attack. With exercise, of course, your heart rate's gonna go up and that just makes sense because if you're being active, you need more sugar and more oxygen. So therefore you're gonna have to pump more blood to it. With fitness numbers, mine's 62, you should find out your own. 
The weird thing is my uh, heart, uh, my fitness number actually tends to beat most students, even though I'm an old fogey. And most of yours are pretty good. They're going to be up in the 50 to 56 category. And that's because you're athletes, most of you, and you're young. And being athletes, that means you exercise regularly. So that exercises your heart and your heart gets bigger. And if it gets bigger, then it has to do less pumps. Uh, really good athletes can have a, a heart rate that's like down in the 40 category if they're really healthy because they don't have to pump it so much. It also makes your blood vessels larger because like any muscle, if you exercise it, it gets bigger because it's needed. And that means bigger tubes, less need to pump each time to do that. Your blood pressure therefore would decrease. So doctors are always looking to see if your blood pressure is too high. If it's, if it's low, that can be a problem, but lower blood pressures can also be an indication in the healthy range that you've got a really good cardiovascular system. Now, why would my numbers be so good even though an old I was a division one athlete, so I played way too much soccer in my life, and now I just chase little boys around, so my numbers aren't as good as they used to be, but I'll get over it, all right? Cool things about this is you should try the lab because it's fun, and you'll learn stuff from it. It'll get you ready for medical school or nursing school or whatever you're going to go into, or just try it out to learn it. The other part of that is I would normally show you at this part of the day a pig heart, and I would show you that the atria are much thinner because they only have to blood, pump blood into the ventricle. The ventricles are super thick because they're pumping to the whole system or the pulmonary, and then you'd actually see the valves that are there with the cords that attach them, and I'd talk to you about how uh, this certain person that I'm related to had surgery on their chordae tendony to replace them because their heart was getting old and they were getting a murmur. I won't say who it was. That, of course, means that they repaired the cords, put on a plastic uh, little ring in here to reinforce the doors, and now the love dub sounds correct. And I'd show you some cool stints where they can go in and fix things like the coronary arteries that feed the outside muscle of the heart. When those get filled up, they have to do bypass, which means they have to take and literally create a, a detour around those things. And if you have like a triple or quadruple bypass, that's that many more blood vessels you've attached to the coronary arteries, the ones that feed the heart itself, and that can prevent the, the heart from not getting the oxygen it needs, hence preventing a heart attack from happening, because that's when the, the heart muscle starts to spasm and die and can't get enough oxygen. Less donuts, although I do miss my NHS donuts. Cool. I'm done blabbing for now. Hopefully you got an idea of how diastolic and systolic blood uh, pressure works, systolic being the system, the higher one, diastolic being the black back pressure of the actual vessels, telling you about the, the vessel's health. We'll continue with a bit of cardiovascular next time, and then we'll do a respiration lab virtually, which also is fun and sad that we'll miss it, but you can do it at home with really bad music. You're going to start digging into GR44, which is the excretory system. Kidneys are really interesting things with their nephrons, and we'll dig into that pretty darn soon. All right, do not forget that we have a after school on the 21st will be our next AP review session number two, where we'll finish off the 2013 that you'll be assigned that day. This week, you should be working on the 2016, unless you already did it with me on the 14th. Yeah, sure. Stay cheesy, Tahoma. I will.